Hello everyone and welcome to today's episode right here on the School of Radiance podcast. The place to be for all things healthy skin, slowing aging, and looking and feeling our best. Not only with the skincare and rejuvenation that we might decide to utilize and receive, but also healthy living practices to help us navigate this beautiful life with more grace and ease and look and feel our most radiant selves. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about phytonutrients and skincare, giving you some of the ins and outs behind the scenes with a fellow skincare founder. And of course, many of you know, I'm in that journey as well with being in the third phase of research and development for just an incredible cleanser that I'm sh- really thrilled to be sharing with you all at the right time. So Julie and I are going to be talking about that because she's been creating products herself as well since about 2000. And nine. And before we get into today's episode, big shout out and thank you to our sponsor Organifi. As you know, I love to sip on antioxidants and adaptogens throughout the day. And what this does for me is it just helps my body manage stress and just continue to give me the antioxidants and superfoods that I need in a delicious way. Head on over to my biohacking page over at theschoolofradiance.com forward slash biohacking, you're going to see the Organifi products right at the top there. And I love every single flavor of theirs. They're absolutely beautiful and delicious. And be sure to use promo code Varga for 20% off of your next Organifi order. Let me warmly introduce you to today's guest. We have Julie Longyear joining us today. And in her late 20s, Julie was beset by adult acne and the frustration and failed attempts to claim her skin finally led her to make to take matters into her own hands after dozens of store-bought products only made things worse a unique personally handcrafted herbal moisturizer was what finally set her on the path to peace with her skin she transitioned her herbal products business into skincare and launched a full facial collection in 2009 Over the last 15 years, her products have positively impacted tens of thousands of people, won over a dozen industry awards, and has been used by famous faces like Lena Headley, Karis Van Houten, and Dakota Fanning. To solve skin problems, first you need to understand them. So a lot of Julie's time is spent with her nose deep in databases of scholarly research papers, looking for exciting new information to piece together why those problems happen in the first place. She loves finding new research on the unique chemistry of plants and how they impact skin conditions like acne, rosacea, eczema, dryness, hyperpigmentation, and more. Each of her recipes must solve a specific problem and must do it well. As a former shopper and someone who still has sensitive acne-prone skin in middle age, Julie understands what it's like to feel frustrated and unsure about which product to purchase and who to trust. It's important for her to leave each person smarter and more empowered and to provide an authentic, transparent voice of reason in the marketing quagmire that is the modern cosmetic industry. And you can learn more about Julie Longyear over at blissoma.com. We're going to have some information on her as well in the show notes for today's episode. So one of the things that I loved about reading your bio, Julie, is that you are a fellow beauty nerd as well. And Mm -hmm. some of you listening, and Julie, you may not know this either, but I've written about five research articles on rejuvenation, algorithms for the eyes, for the jawline, and then recently one on oxidative stress. So you have worked with lots of clients over the years, and so have I in the clinic and also online since 2011. And absolutely, there are some big things we see happen during perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopause. So I really look forward to getting into that with you and nerding out a little bit and talking about ingredients and how certain ingredients can help support uh, different aspects of skin conditions we may be experiencing. So Julie, before we kick things off with some of the other questions that I have for you today, I'd love to ask you first and foremost, what is radiance to you? Mm. So I, this is going to be a little bit of a roundabout answer. Um, I am a bit of a doer. 
Um, and it, it's something that like, I, I put a lot of energy into what I, what I do in the world, whether it's like projects or designing an, a new, um, like a new recipe or, uh, communicating with people, writing emails. Like I feel like there's always something on my list to do. And there's always something I, I tend to feel like the more I do, the more impact I have, but I know that's not always true. Um, and when I hear the word radiance, I think of more of a state of effortlessness, um, where it's inherent versus, uh, something that you actually have to have to make happen. I feel like there is like kind of a, just an energy that's circulating on its own that you don't necessarily make happen. Um, it's, it's more of a natural state. So it's, um, something that for me, um, I have to remind myself to like step back from, from all the doing, 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 and just like allowing it's, it's almost a state of allowing, I would say, as well as like, you know, there needs to be, you need to feed that energy. So I would say the doing maybe should be the feeding of that energy so that it's there to start off with. Yes, absolutely. So I have a little bit of a different perspective. And those of you who listen to the show, I love hearing other people who have had lived experiences and also who are fellow health entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in their own right, mothers, fathers, professionals. And one of the things that I've noticed about radiant people, because I've studied this for a really long time, and I typically see it in individuals who are aged 60 to 90. I typically actually don't mm. see it in younger individuals. And it's this, it's this shine. And it actually, I would say, definitely doesn't happen by accident. And Ayurveda actually has a really great definition of this. In Ayurveda, the radiant body is the 10th body. We have our body, mind, spirit, energy as our first four bodies. Now, depending on the quality of how our body, mind, spirit, energy are operating, and also from a more scientific, quantitative approach, the amount of oxidative stress we have in our body from air, water, lighting, electromagnetics, parasites, pathogens, yeast, heavy metals, mold, all of those things. The more balanced we are and the more pure we are, which is, I definitely would say is very intentional, especially with using clean personal care products as well, that the more pure we are, the brighter our radiance is going to be. So what you did mention in a roundabout way of how we do need to take a step back and perform our self-care practices and put that on the pedestal on the forefront as being really important so that we show up as our best version. I would say it is very intentional, uh, especially with the beautiful radiant people that I serve. So I wanted to share that with you as well. So I'd Great love to, to ask, yeah, I'd love to ask you the question here, Julie. You shared before we started recording, you're going through some things yourself in the beautiful stage of life that you are going through. What would you say are some of the biggest ways that hormones can influence our skin health? Well, hormones are either wonderful helpers or can be an immense challenge to maintaining the skin wellness that we are looking for. Um, you have hormone receptors all throughout your skin. So they're one of the biggest organs that's impacted by hormone shifts. Um, they can react to estrogen, testosterone, stress compounds. Um, so if your adrenal hormones are, you know, circulating and you're very high stress, um, that's going to impact the quality of your skin barrier so that it's not going to perform as well. So maintaining hormonal wellness is really critical to maintaining healthy skin. And it's usually when I'm telling people about skincare, I always feel like I need to mention that it's, you know, half inner, half outer, like you can't have a great result unless you take care of both. And I think that oftentimes hormonal impacts are really underestimated, like the internal uh, side of things, like we think we can control everything from the outside. 
And there are some wonderful skincare products out there that do beautiful things um, for us. But if we don't also address what's going on inside, we're not really getting the complete solution. And we're also not going to feel our best. And kind of like you're discussing the idea of radiance, I personally see the skin being in its best, most attractive state when our body is in a good place. Um, it, it's like a window into your overall health and like the state of your whole body. And usually disruptions indicate something in our bodies that needs attention. So we might need to change what we're eating or we might need to change how we're sleeping or um, you know, maybe our workload is too heavy or we have family members causing us stress. All those things can really impact our appearance, but then the appearance is really just kind of a signal. Um, you know, it's always, we always want to look our best, right? Everybody wants to look great. But I think that the more useful thing about like kind of monitoring how we look is more to tell us what's going on inside and what might need our attention, because we can get a lot of clues about what's happening inside our bodies from what's going on with our skin. Mm -hmm. So let's go a little bit deeper here because yes, that's a, that's a lot of us really know that and understand that. And if we are taking a look at what our skin and our eyes are trying to tell us, we, we do need to take action and listen to this. So say for example, you are ages 37 to 42, you're starting to notice some shifts with your skin, maybe around perimenopause sort of like this seemingly aging overnight. It's not all in your head. I hear this a lot <laughs> with clients that I work with in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. And it's not all in your head. Your body is going through hormonal shifts, primarily with the drop of estrogen. So keeping things balanced is really key. So for all of you tuning in, if you're looking for solutions on how to eat to support your body and then have better skin, I also really like the Viome gut test. You can find that on my biohacking page. And before we started recording, I actually, of course, asked Julie what her blood type is. And a free tip is to actually look at eating for your blood type instead of going online and listening to different bloggers and influencers talking about, oh, here's a great skin diet. Well, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And one of the other things that you did mention was stress and adrenal fatigue. Now, of course, everyone's like, oh, stress. Well, stress is a sign of being alive. We experience obstacles. We experience roadblocks. But it's how we manage overcoming those stressors and roadblocks is really key, which is actually why I kicked things off with this episode with actually sharing an adaptogen formula. Because if we're consuming these adaptogens throughout the day, then that's really going to help our body manage that oxidative stress that can come through emotionally, or if we're not getting enough sleep, or if things are going on in our personal and professional lives. So what we want to listen to with the skin are things like skin redness, skin dryness, hyperpigmentation. I used to have acne like yourself too, and those breakouts would take weeks to go away, and then I'd have that redness afterwards. However, if we listen to, okay, if skin's telling us something's going on, there's some shifts, that's the, that's the time to really go by what I would say, living that 90 to 99% of the time really clean with purifying air, water, lighting, electromagnetics, eating the right foods for you and not living in moderation quite so much. But when things are feeling and looking pretty good, maybe that's where you can maybe have a treat, but do listen to yourself. And also with our eyes, the eyes are the window to the soul, the skin, I would say the skin and the eyes are the window to how we are feeling internally. And so if your eyes are red and itchy and dry and irritated, that's also a sign that things are going on on the inside as well. So I agree with you, Julie, that really taking this inside out approach is so incredibly key. And a lot of people just think, oh, I'm having some skin stuff. I'm just going to buy this skincare product that mm -hmm. I see an ad for on Facebook or Instagram. And I'll try that, right? We don't want to be triers. Mm -hmm. We want to trial things and do things, but we don't just want to try things and then fill up our 
beauty drawer where products go to die. We all have it. And one of the <laughs> things I'd love to get into with you, Julie, because before we started recording, you actually said something that was actually something that I've come to learn over the years as well, especially with you and I being skincare product creators, what that looks like. Now, you mentioned about investors in skincare companies, some of the pros, some of the cons with that. So tell us how you ended up funding your products. Did you use outside investment? Maybe why? Why not? What are some of the things that uh, uh, listeners really should know about the beauty and skincare industry? Well, this is a very interesting topic um, because it is kind of the, if, if you were in the Wizard of Oz, this is like pulling aside the curtain so that you can see the wizard and who's making, you know, everything happen. Um, because realistically, the modern beauty industry is very heavily an investor playground for the most part, I would say. And we had a really beautiful renaissance of independent businesses, I would say around the time that I um, entered the market, like especially the green beauty world. Um, there were many founders, like individual founders like myself that joined the beauty industry in an effort to provide something that was better quality and more conscious for the planet. And then that industry, because it became popular, um, had a lot of investment money that came into it and the trajectory changed substantially and it's become you know different than it was 10 years ago and um, not necessarily for the better um, though the the green beauty world is technically thriving from a business standpoint it's been um, hard to watch companies basically change to a point where they are unrecognizable so i'll, I'll kind of at this point go back to my beginnings. So I um, started running my own little business in college, actually. I mean, I wasn't making skincare at that time, but I have been very entrepreneurial through my adult life. Um, I get severe migraines. And so one way that I could take care of myself was by working for myself. And so I, at the time I was sewing uh, garments for people. So I would take orders and I was one of the first people to have a little web store on the internet in the late nineties, um, before it was really a huge thing. And like now everybody's online. And so it was never like a question. I was, I was always willing to spend the money that I had to make things happen. Um, and that same pattern, uh, traveled into my herbal business, um, when I started making herbal products and then the skincare line specifically. So I did have some, a little bit of help from family. Um, to start off with, my dad had been like a vice presidential level um, executive at a number of different companies and was very excited about his one of his children starting a business. And he participated in the first few years of me getting the business launched and provided a little capital towards things like my trademark, which is the sort of thing that's very important to have and can be very expensive um, as you get going. But, you know, to someone, I'm more of an artist and like he was more of the legal and structural mind behind things while I was creating things. So it allowed me to focus on what I was best at. So I was very fortunate to have a little bit of family support and then uh, took out a substantial amount of credit card debt uh, in order, cause like I was very young. Um, I was not coming from like a high paying industry job. Um, I tried applying to bank loans at that point and no one, we didn't, I didn't have any assets. I was straight out of art school and, you know, didn't have any collateral to put down, didn't have a house or anything. So, um, could not get a bank loan. So I went with credit cards to start off with. And then, um, after 2007, when I wanted to release the skincare line, I got, I was lucky enough to get an SBA loan. So, which was about $25,000. And that's actually what helped launch my skincare collection. And at the time we were able to do some very grassroots marketing. We worked with a lot of bloggers and there was a very healthy uh, blog environment at that time. And basically instead of being such um, a profit-based influencer landscape, like it is today where people are paying thousands of dollars for posts, 
there were a lot of bloggers that, you know, had very cheap ad space or were willing to just review products. And so we'd send stuff out and we were able to work on a very minimal marketing budget. Um, I got divorced almost like right away the year that I, uh, launched the skincare line. So that added a little bit of extra financial pressure. Um, but it also meant it was really crucial for me to make it work because I certainly was not going to let all the, the two years worth of formulation work and design and everything that I had put into the collection just fade away uh, because of that personal challenge. So um, there was there was a year where, you know, we uh, lived very minimally, let's call it. Um, you know, I, I had a young child at the time. She ate, you know, breakfast at school and um, I really pinched pennies to make it all happen. And we just kept reinvesting. And over the years, I've done all kinds of debt financing. So um, we do not, I'm still the sole owner of the company. So none of the uh, obligations and financial uh, capital that I have taken on has impacted the ownership structure of the company. And that really has allowed us to maintain the integrity of the brand. It has also meant a much slower growth trajectory than a lot of companies might have because with the amount of money that's in the skincare world um, out there and the number of investment companies that are funding businesses, they enter the space with a lot more capital to spend to reach people and it is important to be able to reach people. Um, attention is money. And that's something, you know, like basically it's worth something. And it is hard to get that attention from people if you don't have the ability to pay other people to talk about your products. Um, you know, in, people all want to charge for Instagram posts and things like that. It is no longer like it used to be where it was much more friendly and person to person. It is really a business um, promoting things now. So um, I have seen a lot of interesting things over the years with investors coming into other independently owned businesses and then seeing the ethics of those businesses drastically change. And I, I don't mean a little bit like even uh, like as one of the bigger brands that I would say as an example, um, Horst Reckelbacher, the founder of Aveda, some years ago sold Aveda and then started a new company called Intelligent Nutrients. Intelligent Nutrients was like his new baby where he he could do all the things that had happened in ingredient innovation and like make a certified organic um, hairstyling line that like it literally had the food grade seal on it. Um, and Can it still have organic canola oil? Uh, say it again. <laughs> I where I, I, I uh, noticed that, yes, also some of the other big brands out there that have worked with investors, that formulations has shifted, including Aveda, including Beauty Counter and a few other lines where they're using yes. canola oil now, but they still have mm -hmm. a half decent rating on EWG and Yucca. So you, you've you mm -hmm. mentioned a couple really key things here, and I want to go a little bit deeper into something here. Um, that you did mention, thank you for sharing your background, that you still remained resilient in mm. your product development and your business. And, you know, I, I commend you for that, for sticking with it, because a lot of people don't. And then they go to work with investors and then the investors say, hey, let's start adding canola oil to make the margins of the profits better and things like that. And, you know, the whole green beauty world, I have... That when, when products are called all natural and green and things like that, there is a big thing called greenwashing that I'm sure you've seen happen over the years. And we still have to be very careful. We still have to go through the ingredients and ensure that they're still free of parabens, phthalates, sulfates, artificial dyes, fragrances. And, uh, you know, to this day, I still don't think that organic canola oil is any good. But then there's another layer where we need the products to be kept stable and that bacterial growth doesn't happen in the product itself when it's being formulated. But I hear you with, with what the avenue that you chose to go, which is actually a very similar avenue to myself too. I can't help but notice the parallels when you were speaking because I've also chosen not to work with investors for this very reason, all self-funded by our community and me simply reinvesting everything that comes in back to... Mm -hmm 
at eventually making some incredible products. But a lot of people don't do that. They have investors come in and they want higher margins and better profits. And we've really seen that happen over the last few years with some of the biggest brands out there, even starting mm-hmm. to add canola oil. Aveda used to be actually half decent, but I looked at um, one of my family members' products and I believe I saw sulfates actually as a second ingredient in that. So, They're owned by SC Lauder now. Yeah, so. it, it, I continue on with that, with your take on you know the, the big beauty space, which you know even in the medical aesthetics world, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And even with med spas, we're seeing these, um, you know, big hedge funds and portfolio managers wanting to buy up med spas, wanting to buy up skincare lines to diversify their portfolios. So I would say even now that making intelligent decisions with getting access to clean products and actually supporting businesses where the people are operating with ethics and have that mindset to serve. It's it's not just about the bottom line and the gross and net profits. It's it's really about are these products clean? Do they deliver what you're hoping? And are we supporting good companies as well? So I'd love for you to expand on that and what you've also learned about the investor space and Thank you for sharing your struggles as well. Having not gone down, gone down that route, I can completely empathize with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, to kind of like touch back. So Horst passed away a few years ago. And when he died, the company got left to his wife and daughter. And they brought on an investment firm. And the investment firm totally revamped the product line that he had created with Intelligent Nutrients and re-released it as... I mean, it was completely different from the original line that he had created, which really to me stresses the value of individuals within this very complex system, because the only reason that anything does come out more pure um, and with its ethics intact is due to the care of even one person guiding that product process and saying no to all of the other alternatives that are out there, saying no to making a little bit more profit in order to cut ingredient costs, Um, you know, paying more where you could choose to pay less because you know it's going to make a difference for people's skin. And I think that that really can come, there are so many influences always around anyone trying to bring an idea to market and you have to have a really strong vision and a strong reason why you're doing it. Because if the reason is profit, then you're going to make all kinds of decisions that don't necessarily benefit people. If the goal is to benefit people, to heal, you know, to bring something to them that will really improve their lives, if that's the primary goal, then all your decisions kind of circle around that goal. And I think that that's what makes all the difference, really. Um, And that is not something that any venture capital firm is going to offer to a company. Um, Their primary goal is to make money. That's why they exist. And so if you take money from that, it can result in um, compromising your values. And it can also result in you eventually losing your company because especially if they take a controlling share um, or they have specific rights according to your um, LLC agreement or whatever other structure you've come up with, they could basically force you to sell the company. You know, maybe they put in five years and then after that you have to sell. Um, And that might not be what you as a person want to do, but it can become inevitable when you make these kinds of deals. And I really do wish that money wasn't such a driver uh, in many of these situations. I'm more of an idealist. I'm kind of like, I'll make it happen no matter what the money stuff around it is. Like I'm, I'm very idea driven. And why can't everybody operate in a way with ethics and integrity? I, I hear you. I'm, I'm surprised when I hear of these things happen. And I've actually even had this happen to one of my closest friends where the, mm-hmm. the board essentially kicked them out. And, yeah. you know, this was a brand that they'd spent 20 years creating. Uh, so I'm so glad that you brought this all up because it is something that the 
the consumer who's purchasing these products, they don't know about these things. And then the practitioner grade skincare line, a lot of you probably have heard about Obagi. And that was offered in medical aesthetics clinics. And for a long time, it was really loved. And then I started to notice some formulation shifts. And then, oh, doctors, Dr. Obagi that founded that, oh, then he created this other line, Zio Skin Health. I, I wonder why. And, and um, as many of you know, I sell some of their products, but I don't sell all of them. So I actually sift through you know, 18 different companies I work with, which products are the superstars, which ones are the duds. And that's what you find on my skin shop. And yeah, this, this whole concept of someone who creates a, a, their baby and then can have uh, investors, you have to have a board set up, then eventually say, oh yeah, no, now it's time to sell your company. It's just, that's just heartbreaking. So what, what we're doing, Julie and Julie, you and I, is we're setting our companies up so that at the end of the day, we are the decision makers and nobody can end up telling us to add things like canola oil to increase margins, which is happening at an alarming rate. And actually, you can even go on Beauty Counter website and look up canola oil in the search bar and you'll see two products pop up. So that EWG and that Yuka app, another thing just behind the scenes for people to know is that people actually do pay to be EWG certified. I have looked into this. I am a huge nerd. Um, also, one of my really good friends is an investigative journalist. So she taught me a lot about how to really do some research on this stuff. So just some things to know. That's why it's so great to tune into podcasts here and get to know the people behind the companies like Julie and I and lots of other beautiful founders that make biohacking products, that make supplements, that basically make things that we can use throughout our life. Julie, do you have any closing words for us today? Mm. I would I would say I would love for people to go back to a time when the relationship that they form is with more the more people as you're discussing. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think that we've gotten to a very impersonal place where a brand sort of stands in for a person. And I think that you're much more likely to have a rewarding experience when you connect with people because people are what makes really great businesses. And when you know who is behind, you know, what you're purchasing, uh, that makes a much bigger impact in your daily life. And usually that's going to involve going beyond, say, your local mass market retailer. And this is for all kinds of products, whether it's something for your home or, um, you know, a new mug that you want to drink your coffee out of every day and um, or your skincare. And uh, what I know is that connecting with individuals um, for the goods that we use in our lives is much, much more meaningful and usually results in the creation of a better product and, and you getting better results than if, you know, you kind of just go with the easiest option that's out there. Because unfortunately, that's usually not set up to be the most nurturing option. Here, take an online skin quiz. Okay, here you go. Here's a routine just for you. No, it's so much more nuanced than that. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. It is about relationships. Actually, right after this call, I'm about to do a lovely one-on-one -on -one session for a dear client of mine. And I do like to take the time to listen to what their skin goals and needs are, but also their values. What does their lifestyle look like? What's their budget? How can we create a routine that's going to work for them? And I love to, again, form those relationships with, you know, those of you tuning into the show, Julie, meeting through recording podcasts. And yes, I also agree with you. I, I help other practitioners brand themselves and their clinics to have successful medical aesthetics practices. And people fall in love with people. They don't fall in love with branding. That's really key. Mm -hmm. And full disclosure, I have not yet had a chance to try your products yet, Julie. I do look forward to trying them. And for all of you tuning in here, you know that if I love something, it's going to be on my skin shop over at theschoolofradiance.com. And this is a really 
really lovely opportunity that I actually have to get to meet people like Julie, who are the founders of different companies and products and go to different events and health events and meet the founders of different technologies that we can use to purify our air, water, lighting, electromagnetics, detoxing. Because I will tell you, when you have this insider perspective and you see how companies treat their employees, if I catch wind or sniff that they're shadiness, I drop them and I don't even think about it. If I meet somebody at an event and I can tell pretty quickly that they're not operating of integrity, you'll never hear me talk about their products. And that trust that you all have tuning into the show here, uh, I know that's why you're here and that, you know that's why I do this work too, because if I was listening, I'd wanna be listening to someone who operated that way as well. So Julie, we have your website here at blissoma.com, B-I-B-L-I-S-S-O-M-A.com in the show notes. And where else can people find you? We are sold through skincare professionals uh, nationally. So we have uh, between like 150 to 200 different estheticians um, who are holistic focused that carry our products and use them in their facial treatments. So um, the lucky people can go to our website and look and see if there is someone nearby to them. We're still you know, growing and working on establishing more practitioners in more places, but some of you might actually have a facialist nearby that could give you a facial with Blasoma products, which is a wonderful experience and really um, adds a lot of depth to the whole, um, we, we think of them as being like extensions of our company because they really bring the products to life on people. Um, and they also retail them, so you can pick products up there. Um, we're sold internationally, but I, from what I understand that your audience is mostly U.S., so um, probably their local esthetician or our website would be the best options to pick up some of our products. Great. Well, I look forward to trying your products, and I teach you know, medical aesthetics practitioners, doctors, nurses, estheticians, spa and clinic owners, and I'm always looking for, for brands to suggest. So... Uh, basically, if I love it, you know that I'm going to be sharing that information with the different practitioners that I teach. I also love that you've you've taken that approach to also protect your brand because counterfeit products online, just a tip here, everybody, don't buy anything you put on or in your body from Amazon or eBay, these third-party auction websites. Yeah, we're, we're really aligned with a lot of things, Julie. And it's been an absolute pleasure getting to know you and look forward to staying in touch. Thank you everyone for listening right here to today's episode on the School of Radiance podcast. Learn more about today's guest and the ways that I can serve and support you on your skin and rejuvenation journey over at theschoolofradiance.com. And hopefully sometime soon, Julie will also have her own podcast as well. Have a beautiful, high vibe, radiant day, everybody. And I will see you again right here on the School of Radiance podcast. Thank you.